Watch this. To um, take a 30 year career and tell me you must leave in three hours. Dennis Doan, no longer Boise's fire chief as of this afternoon. Political payback? The city won't say, but he will. Wrongly convicted and sent to prison for decades. What happens when they get out? How can you compensate someone for years they won't get back? New legislation is taking that into consideration. Bring your child to work day, that's a real thing. But what happens when you need to bring them to a college class? If Mr. Mickus is your professor, he's got you covered. A biology edition of Feel Good Friday. Best case scenarios, changing of the guards, or in this case, city administrators, usually go down quietly or without much noise. This past week has been anything but a best case scenario when it comes to the city of Boise and its fire chief. Dennis Doan, the chief of the Boise Fire Department for the past 12 years, was asked to step down Monday by Boise's new mayor, Lauren McLean. Not unexpected, mayors get to choose who they want running departments. And given he backed Dave Beter for mayor last fall, Chief Doan expected nothing less than political payback, but he thought maybe he could leave on his own terms. That is a ceremonial retirement after nearly, nearly three decades of service. Mayor McLean had other ideas and gave him only two options, according to Doan, accept a separation with a non-disclosure agreement or be fired that day. Well, that day, Chief Doan says he was put on paid administrative leave. Two days later, he took it public, standing on the city hall steps to say he did nothing wrong to be put on leave. And that's when things escalated, with Mayor McLean announcing city council would instead vote to fire Chief Doan next week, then announcing a special meeting to do that very thing today. And that's what everyone was expecting when that meeting came and went without a vote today. Because earlier today, Chief Doan sent his resignation letter to the mayor and city council effective immediately, saying, it appears that I'll be unable to tell the council my side of the story before you make your decision today. So they accepted his resignation today. Well, this whole week, Mayor McLean has said nothing publicly, effectively reciting the uh, rules of personnel matters. Today, despite what appears to be the end of this saga, she's refused to, or she has continued, that is, to refuse to comment. I understand that people have questions um, and will have questions, but as mayor, it's my responsibility to protect our city, her residents, and our employees, and that includes the privacy of individuals. And so I have to follow laws and policies and procedures, and that means that I can't talk about personnel matters. So she's not talking, but Chief Doan is. And today he sat down with us to talk about what this week has been like for him and where he goes from here. Could you describe your relationship with Mayor McLean? I've known her for over 20 years, uh, 15 to 20. Uh, I used to be the lobbyist for the firefighters and she would be up at the legislature. And I got to know her a little bit during that time. Uh, in all of her campaigns, uh, I've endorsed her, I've supported her, I've written her uh, checks um, and uh, door knocked. I've had her to my home and had a, uh, a house party for her. So was Monday a surprise? Well, um, I did support Dave Beter. Uh, and um, I think that tells something about me. I'm a very loyal person. Uh, I've worked for somebody that appointed me 12 years ago, and I'm going to stick with that person. And that's the type of person I am. And so I did. Uh, but I knew if, if he didn't win, that a lot of times uh, department heads will have to move on. And, and I was okay with that. I just thought I would get, after 30 years of service to the city, a little bit of time to at least announce my retirement and just tell the community and celebrate my 30 years on this department. Uh, and my 12 years as fire chief. But to say uh, you have three hours to leave uh, was embarrassing and humiliating. When she handed you that paper yeah. on Monday, yeah. what was it about it that you said, I don't, I don't agree to that? Well, she gave it to me and said, this is your last and final offer. The first page said um, that the retirement would be effective immediately. And you're on administrative leave. Um, that's what was hurtful to me, 
to um, take a 30-year career and tell me you must leave in three hours. And the embarrassment that I had at my own office, my entire command staff and all, there were firefighters in there watching me pack up my office. It was embarrassing. Administrative leave kind of carries a connotation with it, doesn't it? Exactly. And that's why um, I was frustrated uh, and upset. Um, my own family called and said, what did you do wrong? Uh, there was an assumption that I had done something wrong. And if I would have signed that piece of paper, I could not be talking to you today. And this whole community would have jumped to a conclusion. I've heard a lot, there must be more to the story, there must be more to the story, there must be more to the story. There simply isn't. I did nothing wrong. I was asked to leave. And again, I understand that and I'm totally okay with that. Do you think this would have gone differently if you hadn't stood on City Hall steps and gone public? I mean, usually these things aren't as public. Yeah. Well, um, I, was, I was boxed in. If I sign the agreement, the whole community wonders what I did wrong. Then I thought, well, what if I just retire? How's that for an option? So I didn't know what else to do. I was told this is a last and final offer or you'll be fired. So you resigned this morning? So um, I knew um, I've not been able to tell my story to the council other than that email last night. I, I haven't been able to talk to any of them. They haven't heard from me. Uh, I haven't got any due process in this. And I get it, I'm an at-will employee and I'm not afforded due process. But um, out of respect, you usually do listen to the other side and, and listen what happened and um, I knew I wasn't gonna get that. Um, and I thought it would be better just to resign. What have the last couple of days been like for you? I mean, it's been a week since Monday, but what have they been like for you from family, friends, community standpoint? It's been twofold. Um, first, my, uh, my wife and my kids have had uh, a horrible week, uh, and I feel so bad for them that my kids had to see their dad go through this. My wife has taken the entire burden on her shoulders the last few days. Not sleeping, um, watching people uh, turn on her and us because they think I did something wrong. On the other hand, the love and support that I've got too has been overwhelming. My mother texting me saying, I'm sorry my son's going through this. Uh, it hurt. Uh, and it makes me sad, but I also a lot of people. Uh, Dave Beter has been my rock this week. He has been uh, such a great friend, uh, checking in on me, working for me, helping me through this. Uh, he gave me an opportunity in my life that uh, I can never repay him for what he's done for me. You're not ready to retire. You're not, you're no. not that age yet. No. What now? I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to do. I was born and raised here. It's my community. Uh, there's only one fire chief job in the city and I don't have it anymore. Uh, I don't wanna move. I don't know what a firefighter does after 30 years uh, when he still needs to work. So um, I, I really don't know what the next step is. We'll, we'll just have to see. I'm only 51, I wanna work and, and plan on working, but uh, we'll see. Sad. Yeah. Are you angry? No, um, I'm not angry. Uh, I, I totally forgive her and the council for what they did. Um, I love this community. I love this fire department. Our firefighters put their life on the line each and every day. And every day I got to wake up for the past 30 years and put my uniform on. I am so blessed uh, that I got to do that. What a ride. Um, I'm not angry at all. I forgive him. Well, Dennis told me the retirement date that he suggested for May was just arbitrary. He was just hoping to get some time to get his post employment paperwork and plans in order. He wasn't looking for three months of paid vacation. As for the city side, I asked Mayor McLean if given permission to speak to Dennis Doan's resignation, would she? No, I was told she had no further comment other than what she has already shared this afternoon. Thank you. 
convicted of crimes they didn't commit, and a Boise State professor is backing a bill that compensates them for years behind bars. Single moms don't have a lot of options when childcare is compromised, but a single mom who is also a college student, her science teacher gladly gave her options. And crayons, we'll explain. So, do you have a Feel Good Friday story to share? Text us about it, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. We'll read some of your responses at the end of the show. Prisons are punitive. They're meant to punish people for their crimes. What if you're sent to prison, though, for a crime you didn't commit? You could spend years being punished for something you didn't do. So what does the state of Idaho do if you're wrongly convicted? Well, legally, they don't have to do anything, but there is a new bill that is trying to change that. And Joe, how is this going to work out? Well, Brian, uh, Idaho is one of 15 states that okay. right now they don't compensate people that are sent to prison for crimes they didn't commit. That includes people like Charles Fain, for example. He was convicted in 1983 of kidnapping, raping, and murdering a nine-year-old girl, and he sat alone in his cell for 23 hours a day on Idaho's death row for 17 years, the entire time maintaining his innocence. It wasn't until 2001 that DNA tests, which were not available during the case, ended up clearing him of any wrongdoing. He was later freed, but the legal system, he says, failed him. And many believe that Fain is owed something for the state of Idaho. Now, Fain tells me today that he's happy to be free, but the state, again, legally doesn't owe him anything. That's what House Bill 384 looks to change. In short, if someone is wrongfully convicted and sent to prison, they're entitled to $60,000 a year or $75,000 a year if they're on death row for as long as they are incarcerated for. So in Fain's case, he'd be paid at least about $1.3 million. He says that he's forgiven everyone involved, but that doesn't change the fact that he couldn't make a living the entire time he was sitting in a prison cell. He tells me this afternoon he still remembers, though, exactly what it was like being released. Oh, you can't describe it. <laughs> just, no, I don't know how to put it into words. You just, wow. All the rooms are gone, all the, all the noise and fresh air and all that stuff. So they took away 17 years of my work, me working. So I'm still working to make up for what I lost. So. And in the committee this afternoon, he sat next to Christopher Tapp, another Idahoan that was wrongfully convicted. We told you his story. The bill passed unanimously out of the House earlier this session, which is very impressive. It passed 70 to nothing, which 
I mean, very rarely, Brian, do you get something that has 100% bipartisan sure. support, but the bill still has a way to go. Again, it passed the House, it was in a Senate committee today. In the Senate committee, they decided to send it to the amending order. Sometimes that could mean that the bill is dead, but not in this case. They sent it to the amending order because they said they want to fix the mechanics of House Bill 384, not change the intent of it, but All right. make sure that it's absolutely written correctly because there's a chance they could be paying out millions of dollars in the near future. We still have to see it come back to the Senate committee, pass out of the Senate committee and go to the Senate floor. So it's still got some steps to go, but this is headed in the right direction if you're in favor of 384. Well, you say millions of dollars. I mean, this wrongly convicted, there aren't a lot of them out there, but they're worth something, though, to the people that are wrongly convicted. Yeah, and, and right now the state of Idaho has two to four people that would possibly fall into this uh, category of people that would be entitled to payouts. We have more on our website, ktvb.com, to explain the bill and how it would work. All right, we'll keep track of it. Thanks, Joe. One thing you need to know for this weekend, especially if you're an outdoorsman going up into the mountains, could be a little rough because of some of the strong gusty winds, mainly Saturday, not so much on Sunday, but Sunday could still have some winds. That's why we have a winter weather advisory through here, especially into the central mountains. We don't have one in the western mountains, but that doesn't mean that the winds won't blow, especially above 7,500 feet. This is the area that could receive the most snow, possibly about four to eight inches of snow, but all locations in those mountain areas could be seeing 50, 60 mile an hour winds. Just wanted you to know, be careful with that. Could even be a few slick roads because of that in some of those areas. Right now, it looks kind of milky there. It's covering the topography on our map because we have high clouds that are moving in from the next storm. And there's the storm that's out to the west. It's not a big one. I showed you uh, how much moisture just in the last hour that that's possibly going to present. Once it moves through, storms pretty much start to break up. This next one comes in on Monday, but it looks like it's pretty well weak too for late, very weak as well late Monday night as well as early Tuesday morning. Not expecting a lot in the way of showers. But let's move ahead with the future cast and you'll see the snow in the mountains I was talking about. This is eight o'clock tomorrow morning around Stanley and McCall. Down here toward Boise, we're going to start seeing some showers and continues kind of off and on with some light showers throughout the day. So that's three o'clock in the afternoon and then it clears up on Sunday. Amounts in the way of snow in those mountain locations. Well, we got McCall nearly two inches. Of course, no snow in the mountains and you can see the central mountains below 7500, about three and a half inches of snow and that will be for the Stanley area. Now let's move ahead here. We're looking at rain showers here in the valley and you notice through the day tomorrow that likelihood is generally less than a tenth of an inch of rain that could possibly come through the area. So those temperatures come down basically into the 50s and we will be seeing some of those gusty winds around the area for tomorrow. But good news, they die down on Sunday and then look how all these temperatures start to warm up a bit next week, getting near 60 degrees. It's a position every parent has probably found themselves in. No child care at the last minute. So when this CWI student found herself with nowhere to turn, her professor made sure her three-year-old could keep up. Want to chat? Send us an email, the 208 at ktvb.com, or you can just send us a text, 208-321-5614. We like them both, and we like to read some of your responses at the end of the show.
Unless you are one, you probably don't realize how much teachers actually do for their students. Supplying school supplies, snacks, sometimes even clothes, stuff that's not usually part of the syllabus. Extra, though, isn't usually part of a college professor's curriculum, unless your college professor is Mr. Mickus at the College of Western Idaho. As a biology professor, you'd think he'd know what viral means, right? Well, he really didn't, until word got out about what he did when one of his students had childcare complications. All right, so that's all I want to say about immunoglobulins. Night classes. Question number 13. It's one of the conveniences of community college. Very large phagocytic cells. Twice a week, more than two dozen students meet here for Mr. Mickus's biology class at the College of Western Idaho. It's neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages. Convenience doesn't always equate to easy, though. Eosinophils and basophils. Do the technical terminology can attest to that. So agglutination of the antigens for mass phagocytosis, that is correct. Mr. Mickus knows studying cellular structure is just a stepping stone for his students toward something bigger. An antibody complex. Like 21-year-old Olivia Tovar, a single mom with two jobs in her third year of school. Yep, so I do a lot. She sees physician assistant as her future. Oh yeah, yeah, I have a long road ahead of me. But about a month ago, that road got a bit bumpy when Olivia's babysitter was unable to watch her three-year-old son, Atticus. Convenience became questionable. I never even bothered to ask a professor before, but I was very desperate and I didn't want to miss this lecture, so I reached out. So Olivia asked if she could bring her little boy to class. Is lining up. Mr. Mickus not only said, of course, of he even asked if he should bring him something to color. All sort of geared down to a kid's level. Which he did. I included my own captions and I included color. A coloring book he put together himself in about 20 minutes. He even included the crayons. It wasn't just a generic thing for a kid. It was the exact same subject matter that Olivia was studying as well. So he made like the friendly skeleton and then he made like a very brief description of the human heart. One could say Mr. Mick has showed his heart that day, Get a protein but he didn't think it was a big deal. Because to me, doing something nice for a kid is normal. Until Olivia came to class two days later. And she's like, oh, by the way, Mr. Mickus, did you know that, um, that this has gone viral? And I was like, what has gone viral? The pictures Olivia put out on Twitter. And he was more than willing to let my son come to class. So I thought that was awesome. So did a lot of other people, like more than 150,000 just on Twitter. It spread like wildfire. I wasn't expecting that at all. It was a reaction that resonated. One of the posts said that it pushed her to want to go to school because it was doable. Yeah, so I thought that was really awesome. I would love people to think science is cool. I want children to think that science is cool. As far as social media is concerned, the four R's. Mr. Mickus is cool. I appreciated it a lot. Olivia says she's had to take her son to school just about two other times, and each time it's been great, and the class has been totally cool about it. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome to Idaho, where spring means longer days. We're getting there. Warmer temperatures like today, and yep, it's calving season. Debbie Henderson Mink sent us this picture of her week old calf. I'd say that's a pretty strong calf if you ask me, because look what's on his head. Yep, that's the number seven. So what did Debbie decide to name that calf? Well, Channel seven, of course. Really, that's what she named him. Channel seven. That's a good name, right? That's good. He's a good looking calf. Look at that. How perfect. Look at nature working in wondrous ways. Well, no word there if there's a Mark Johnson or a Larry Gebert calf on that farm. I'm sure we'll hear if there is, though, because Larry will probably tell us about it. All right, we'll be right back with a look at some of your comments about today's show. Stay with us. All right, wrapping up another week on the 208. Some of the comments you sent in during today's show. This one in reference to uh, Chief, former Chief, Fire Chief Dennis Stone resigning today. Department heads, chiefs don't just get asked to leave without cause. I'm pretty sure Mr. Doan isn't quite as innocent as he is trying to sound here. I'd love to hear the other side of this story. So would we. Again, we reached out to Mayor McLean a couple of times and she has said it's a personnel matter. She has no comment. I even asked Dennis Doan if he would give a written consent to allow the mayor to speak to this. And I asked her if she would. She said no, she would still offer no comment. So I don't know when we'll hear the other side of the story. Fire Chief asked to remain on paid administrative leave for two and a half months to get retirement paperwork together. Would have been nice if this could have been resolved out of the public forum, but two and a half months seems like excessive. Well, Chief Doan told me it wasn't about the time. If they had come back and said April 30th, he'd have been fine with that. He just wanted some time to get his paperwork in order with Percy that pertains to his retirement and health benefits following retirement. Understand paying someone wrongfully convicted, but how's that going to be paid? Wendy wants to know. I was told either one lump sum or in increments, a district court will determine that. How about this one? Grocery store, early teenager, opening door, chivalry. 